Kosh, control of substances hazardous to health. What the bloody hell does that mean? And what do we have to do? Let's jump into the intro and then we'll find out. What's up peeps, welcome back to Rebounding Safety. Rebounding Safety is the YouTube channel and podcast doing exactly what it says on the tin. We change the perception of health and safety. So if you're new here, hit subscribe, hit the bell and all of those magical algorithms. Rebounding Safety is brought to you by Risk Fluent, which is our consultancy. So if you're looking for some help with all of this stuff, be it technical stuff like cosh and fire and general health and safety, or the more transformational stuff and the kind of culture and behavioral change, then we can definitely help you. So check out the websites in the description below. So today we are talking all about Kosh. And this is a really interesting topic as much as I've kind of joked over the years on the podcast, I absolutely hate Kosh because it requires a little bit too much maths for my liking, but ultimately it's a serious risk that we do need to manage. Some stats that I've taken from the HSE, occupational lung diseases account for around 12,000 of the 13,000 total annual deaths estimated to be linked to past exposure, primarily to chemicals and dust. 17,000 estimated new cases of breathing or lung problems caused or made worse by work each year. On average for the over the last three years, according to the self-reports of the Labour Force Survey. And all of this is managed by the Control of Substances Hazardous to Health Regulations, so the COSH regs. So these are the piece of legislation that's been put in place to try and make sure that employers manage the risk of chemicals. So what does this actually mean? Chemicals or the, the broad range of stuff that we're talking about in COSH can actually take many forms. Essentially, we're talking about chemicals and we all know what chemicals are but we're also talking about any products containing chemicals fumes dust vapors and mists nanotechnology never thought you'd be talking about that at work gases and asphyxiating gases biological agents basically germs so things that can cause legionnaires and basically if the product has any kind of warning label on it has a material safety data sheet which we'll talk about later has a warning on it it basically then falls into the the criteria for COSH. The main aim of COSH is essentially to stop the, the chemical in any of its form um, getting into the body and causing harm to health. And there are several ways in which it can get into the body. So we're gonna eat it, ingestion, and we can inhale it, e.g. breathe it in. We can have contact with our skin, we can have an injection, or it can get into our eyes. So the aim of the COSH reg, like I say, is to, is in its simplest form, is to identify the hazards of a chemical and then stop it getting into the body. But the COSH regs go a little bit further and they introduce something called workplace exposure limits. So they set limits of which um, you can be exposed to said chemical, fume, etc. You can get these limits for basically a long list of chemicals on a document called EH40. And those EWELs, wells, are legally binding limits. So whilst the cost regs puts a legal requirement on you to manage the risk of all chemicals, if that is reasonably practicable, you have a legally binding limit within those wells as well. Wells as well. <laughs> but additionally to that, you have a few categories of chemicals which are regularly and, and consistently very high risk or quite impactful to uh, the human health. So they then come with a, kind of the next step. So essentially it puts an onus on you to that the exposure must be reduced as far as reasonably practicable. Notice the word must. You're starting to understand why I don't like cars, right? So you must reduce the hazards to health, reduce the risk so far as reasonably practicable for all of those. Feel free to rewind and play it over and over again that it is it is a little bit complicated to kind of remember it all but essentially you'll know as you go, you kind of go through the msds sheet and we'll, we'll go through that later and also the hsc website loads and loads and loads of really good advice on there okay so we've mentioned manage the risk we've mentioned assess the risk we mentioned do as far as reasonably practical what does that actually mean essentially what you have to do is do a cost assessment so if your chemicals in the workplace you have to manage those risks what that means is you have to do a risk assessment 
there's areas for debate whether we have to have a risk assessment for fairy liquid when we don't at home. Personally, I don't think, based off my conversations I have in the past with the HSC and so on, um, but there are people out there that think you do, but, you know, whatever. We can debate about that till the cows come home. But essentially, you have to have done a risk assessment for the risk from chemicals in your workplace. Now, you have to remember that a risk assessment is about enabling you to do work. So we've spoke about this loads of times. You can go check out our risk assessment stuff. But it's an interesting note from the HSE um, that what they've said that is a risk assessment. Remember, a risk assessment is about managing the risk as far as reasonably practicable, not creating a totally risk-free environment, generating lots of paperwork, exaggerating or publicizing trivial risks, stopping important recreational or learning activities for individuals where the risks are managed. And I think, you know, to hear that from the HSE is really, really important for us to remember because I think COSH is one of those things where we end up just having loads of paperwork, actually not really doing much because the, the risk is not that big. It's just general household chemicals. But you do you, that's just my, my kind of soapbox there. A risk assessment is slightly different from a material safety data sheet. So an MSDS, we've mentioned that a couple of times. What is an MSDS? Well, it is what it says on a tin really, it's a material safety data sheet. It will come with the chemical or it'll be on the chemical producer's website. Normally it's so easy to get these. If you haven't got it with it, you can just Google the chemical name and the brand of the company and be able to download it. And it breaks down loads and loads of different sections of everything you need about the chemical to enable you to do the risk assessment. So it'll give you all the hazards classifications of that chemical, the emergency uh, processes to do with that chemical, how to store the chemical, um, you know, the usage of that chemical, um, how it's been kind of tested. It will give you absolutely loads and loads of information. It will give you the wells as well within there. Um, so you don't have to go searching for that on EH40. You might need to sometimes, but essentially you don't have to. Can get a bit complicated when you've got mixtures of chemicals in, in one chemical. Um, but everything you will need will be in that MSDS sheet. So what does a COSH assessment do then? Well, a COSH assessment is basically taking all the information from the MSDS sheet and then combining what how you are using that chemical in the workplace, it basically inserting the human into the process and bringing those two worlds together and enabling you to manage to see the, the risk, sorry. Copy and paste in the MSDS sheet into another document called COSH assessment is not a COSH assessment. It's, it's not suitable, it's not sufficient, and it won't pass HSE, the court, anything. It's just a waste of time and money. The key thing to remember when doing your, your COSH assessment is come back to the bare basics of health and safety, which is the hierarchy of control. Eliminate that chemical wherever you can. You just stop using it, don't need to use the chemical anymore, just get rid of it. You know, engineers and maintenance are gold dust for this stuff, is you've got like, just some, I don't know, turpentine or something, or white spirit just sitting in their, their workshop that they use every now and then. Just just get rid of it. There's like, we don't need it really, just get rid of it. Um, or they're like, well, we do use it every now and then for something, then we can go to the next level down and we can substitute it. So we can substitute it for something that's a bit more modern, a little bit better, a little bit safer. Um, still got a little bit of a risk because it still needs to have that powerful cleaning effect that say white spirit had, um, but ultimately it's a bit safer. So eliminate, can't eliminate, substitute, great, that's your next best option. Where you can't do that, then we move into the kind of next two levels where we're really talking about here is managing the risk. So we start to engineer the risks out. So we will have things like low exhaust ventilation, which would be like kind of drawing out all of the dust or drawing out all of the fumes so that people are not inhaling it. You might even have separation where you can have a whole separate wall um, that you can control a bot or something from the outside and the process can be done from the inside. Um, labs are really good at this. And ultimately there's a clear separation um, between the person and the chemical. That's a great engineered solution there. Engineering controls also normally come in partnership with the next level down, which is administration controls. So here you'll have things like your training, your safe systems work, procedures, whatever you want to call them, policies, risk assessments as well. 
all of that stuff will be rolled into one, normally with the engineering control to come together kind of like a partnership. And then they'll normally be topped off with the bottom of the rung. And, and just remember people, this is the bottom of the rung, um, the lowest requirements. So the last thing you should do is use PPE, not the first, the last. So PPE will also include RPE, which is respiratory protective equipment if you are managing fumes and inhalation and stuff like that. And we'll talk about that in a separate video. So work your way down that hierarchy of control. Eliminate, substitute, engineer, admin, then it's PPE. That, in a nutshell, is Kosh. It's basically a real basic introduction. If you have no idea what Kosh is, hopefully this has given you a real uh, baptism of fire of what Kosh is, what you have to do, your requirements, some kind of little lessons learned from me from over the years. Hopefully that's helped. Um, the HSE actually their Kosh section is really good. There's loads of stuff. There's a Kosh Essentials, there's a Kosh uh, Brief Introduction Guide. There's actually quite a lot of really helpful information when it comes to Kosh um, from the HSC. So go check that out. We'll, we'll put all the links in the description below. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you need some help from us, don't forget to check out the website below for Risk Fluent and we can come and help you with this stuff. But otherwise, I'll catch you next week. Safe. <laughs>